those plants are stunning. <laughs> Thank you. I'm impressed, but my best. Hi, everyone. My name is Christine. If you're new here, I'm a sophomore at Harvard University, concentrating in neuroscience on their pre-med track with a secondary in ethnicity migration rights. And I'm super excited for the guests that I have in this video. So today we have Bernie Nicole and EVA. They are incredible doctors, women of color. They are the hosts of an absolutely amazing podcast called Woke Woke Docs. So just to read a bit off of the description I pulled from Spotify. It's a podcast about the lives of women of color in medicine and health justice, including their unique experiences, viewpoints, and struggles in education, research, and practice. We want to reveal the insights we as women of color uniquely have on how medicine can transform to end health injustices and be a better institution of health, well-being, and healing. So I believe as of a few weeks ago, you guys had over 1.3 thousand subscribers across SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. Spotify, absolutely amazing. Over three seasons with multiple guests doing amazing work at the intersection of social justice and healthcare to let you guys talk about yourselves before I keep on rambling about how amazing you are. I guess we could start off with Bernie. Hey y'all, greetings from San Francisco. Just got out of cardiology clinic, so trying to be homie today. Yeah, my name is Bernie, originally from LA. I like to describe myself as a creator, a healer, and a warrior. And by day, I'm a medical student at UCSF. And and also by day and by evening and by weekend, I do a lot of community organizing. And so I'm the founder and one of the co-organizers of the Freedom Community Clinic. I do this with these beautiful ladies. I'm also the co-founder of the Institute for Healing and Justice in Medicine. And all of that just keeps me so alive and so committed to our people. So next up, we have Nicole. Hi, everybody. I am Nicole Carvajal. I am a student at the UCSF UC Berkeley Joint Medical Program. I am currently working on my master's. I'm trying to understand people's experiences through detention, immigration detention, like in particular. Doing a lot of things that I love to do right now. I'm making pottery. I'm making art, like painting, watercolor, learning to play the piano. A lot of my Passion comes from the ways in which I grew up. So I think we're gonna get a little bit more into it, but that's about it for me. And then finally, we have EVA. Hi everyone, my name's EVA Takumbo. I'm a third year medical student at UCSF. I describe myself as a Nigerian American dancer, singer, also creative, like we're all creatives, but I definitely really love expressing myself through music and dance. And I love to run and stay active and just hang out with friends and do this podcast. It's been really awesome and a great chance for me to build community with other women of color. It's been really, really fun. Thank you all so much for taking the time to chat with me. I did want to just touch really briefly on the podcast itself, maybe hear what exactly the podcast is about from, you know, your perspective, what it's been like, the journey to setting it up. Woke Woke Docs really is a labor of love and it's a personal project that came to life. Nicole and I, when we were starting med school in 2017, we began to see that our people, especially Black, Brown, Indigenous, immigrant communities, were not seen in medical school and in medical education. We didn't hear our narratives and our health justice history. And we were like, nah, you know, we have to make sure that people know. We weren't really like big podcast people before, but we YouTube like how to start a podcast, got all of the stuff delivered to us that we saw on this one YouTube video, started to figure out how to use GarageBand and we still use GarageBand. We're just gonna run with it and we're gonna tell our stories and highlight the people who have really inspired us women of color in medicine and health justice it's just been a beautiful project typically we have episodes that are anywhere from like 45 minutes to an hour we just sort of come together the three of us and whoever our guest is like bernie mentioned it's people in medicine but not just medicine also in health justice people who are actually in the community working with women of color and like youth and doing things basically to advance the good of the world and we just have really fun casual conversations i think the only thing i have to add is really just like how much of a healing experience this is to be the podcast host and being able to interact with folks really dedicating their lives to these things that are impacting us or our communities yeah we, we were going through um existential crises y'all slash continuing to <laughs> so you know we wanted to make that public and just figure it out in public and we're still figuring it out i did just want to rewind um a little bit and ask you all were you always so social justice minded as undergraduates or 
high school students, if you say that you were, what would you say was your main source of motivation? And if not, what eventually led you to adopt that kind of mindset? I don't think I ever really thought like, oh, I'm, I'm a social justice person. I think I really cared about service a lot growing up. For those who don't know, I'm a Harvard alum also, as is Bernie. And that's where Bernie and I met. I felt the stress and the pressure that comes with being a Harvard student, especially with being a pre-medical student. But I think it was something that was always important to me, even in college. I remember I was working in a lab. And I told my PI, I might not be able to make this and that because I really want to volunteer at the shelter. And he said to me like, oh, you don't need to work there. I was like, wait, what? And he was like, well, if you're a pre-med student, you're either going to be a social justice person or you're going to be a scientist. And kind of implying that I shouldn't want to be serving that community. And I was like, how are you going to tell me that I shouldn't want to serve people who are experiencing homelessness? So I feel like when I heard that, I was like, oh, no. Now I'm going to like double down. I'm really going to make sure because there's absolutely no way that you think that I'm going to be a better doctor by not actually investing in those communities. I was always aware that there was dynamics at play and I didn't really understand them. They just felt unfair. I was like in this hustle mentality where I was like, you know what? got to get out, got to keep going, got to do the next thing, got to do the next thing, next thing. At that point, I was like, okay, yeah, bioengineering. I was in math, physics, doing all of the things. For me, it just felt like there were so many things being thrown at me. I had a couple of experiences experiences that really brought forward the need to incorporate my background as part of what I'm going to do in the future. So the story for me is really like this one person who kept missing their appointments, but it's because their guardians were afraid to come in because of documentation. The person ended up having cancer. If there was someone who was aware that that is a barrier to folks, it could have been handled a little bit differently. And that's when I felt like, oh, wow, like this is unjust. And so I started researching and surrounding myself by, with people I studied this in college and like were passionate about it in high school. It was like after college that I really started understanding what was going on. For me, yeah. I think for me, it's just like the rage in my blood is always combined with this deep love for my people, my family, my friends. Being raised in a community that's Filipino and Mexican immigrants where we just took care of each other. And then in college at Harvard, I was like, oh, I guess people don't want to take care of each other. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Not everyone had that communal collective mindset. I always say this, when I learned the word intersectionality for the first time, like I literally started crying because I finally found the language to describe what I was experiencing as an Asian American woman during a time when Black Lives Matter was first coming up. I'm really dedicated to see myself as a bridge between the academy and the community, funneling the resources that they stole from our people back to our people. That's really what I see as community and social justice at the heart. I was really curious to know the idea of like medicine and academia always being on this like really high pedestal. How did you feel as women of color um, entering into those spaces that always seemed pretty inaccessible? How have your experiences changed or maybe affirmed your initial perceptions of these institutions? So these institutions are not ready for us, period. Like there's nothing else to say besides that. Like they're not ready for us, but we're here. And so we're going to make sure that they're ready for us and for the next generations after us. We have to make spaces for ourselves because they don't exist. And so one of those spaces is Woke Woke Docs. Another one is Freedom School. Plenty of other spaces that students create for themselves because there's not that support that students, in particular women of color, need. And by creating these spaces, we're hoping to open the doors to more women of color. I honestly didn't expect it to be so difficult, medical school. Like I didn't anticipate this. And that's not to say like medical school is terrible. Like I've learned a lot and I've made amazing friends, but I wasn't prepared for how ill-prepared these institutions are for us. I did want to jump in really quickly to ask if someone could elaborate on what the Freedom School is in case some of the people watching this don't know. Yeah, so before Woke Woke Docs, we started the Freedom School and long name is Freedom School for intersectional medicine and health justice. It's a community and a healing space. Um, it started in the Bay Area, now it's offered nationally. It's really isolating sometimes to keep doing this uncovering of how violent and unacknowledging medicine has been to our communities. And so we wanted a space to digest and process and talk about a lot of that. So we started literally with like 10 people in this like basement in Berkeley. <laughs> it was really funny. We became huge and we began to really expand beyond medicine and public health. There were community members, activists. So actually one of the big things that we learned from the Freedom School, and I'm going to quote our beloved Margot Okazawa-Rei, who was on one of our episodes, we can't only know what we're 
against. We must know what we are for, and we must do the brave work of imagination in reconstructing what we see. Freedom School continues to be a dope community. It's a living room style thing. And then Woke Woke Docs is really a public manifestation of that. I remember that line. It's not enough to know like what you're against. You also have to know what you're for. Oh my gosh, that hit me so hard. Like I loved that. If you have anything to add, being a woman of color entering into medical schools, what that's been like. I think for a lot of women of color, and I know for a lot of Black women, respectability politics is a very, very big thing we have to deal with. It doesn't always feel like I belong there when I'm the only Black person that I've seen like all day long when there's like bigger things going on in the world and like no one wants to explicitly talk about like the racism that's happening and they're just like oh you know like the political climate (laughs) it's like you mean the police brutality and violence against Black people yes. To be completely honest it's kind of met my expectations academia is not quite there yet so like when I enter these spaces I'm like ah yes not to say that there aren't people who are (laughs) trying to do the work when I was on my medicine rotation People were actually were being very explicit and very upfront about wanting to make sure that medical students are actually cared for, especially like the people of color medical students saying like, you know, if you need time, like that's totally fine. So I actually really appreciated that. I don't think that that same awareness was there even maybe six months ago, let alone like the past years in medicine. It's kind of hard trying to unlearn the respectability politics. There's just not enough Black women that I see around. But when I do see those Black women doctors, especially, it's like, oh, hey, like look at you look at us like we're here you kind of touched a little bit on my next question which a lot of my subscribers were especially interested in knowing the idea that you're like representing your race um in medicine because you are a woman of color would you say that that idea is true that's a good question i don't know that i necessarily feel like i'm representing my race all the time i think i had that mindset back when i was the only black person in my grade from third through eighth grade my understanding of white supremacy was (laughs) very different then than it is now. I didn't understand what white supremacy was then. So it was very easy to be like, oh, I need to act a certain way. Like people are going to think it's because I'm the black girl. They're going to think all black girls are like this. I have a much more nuanced understanding of it now. And so I don't try to place that responsibility on myself. Like I said, I do still understand that there are respectability politics involved. I'm someone who really likes to get to know people and like talk to them. People might think that I'm trying to like cross professional lines or things like that. So I am very cognizant of that, but I don't feel like I am a representation for everyone. There's not that many Black physicians that I see, but there's a decent amount of Black medical students at UCSF. So I feel like they've seen others. <laughs> so like, I hope that they're not just holding everything to me. I don't want to put too much pressure on myself. I just want to be like a good medical student, the best that I can be right now. I'm really glad that you spoke first because it gave me illumination. I was like, why do I feel so uncomfortable with this question? And it's because that whole thing about... Do you feel like you put all the pressure on yourself? Like that is a white supremacist assumption that's put onto folks like us and especially Black and Indigenous folks and Latinx folks who are severely underrepresented in medicine. That puts an undue burden. We deserve better. We deserve, like EVA said, our own standards as to the patient care that we provide. We deserve to not know. We deserve to ask questions. And any pressure that puts us into this little hole, that is such a capitalist white supremacy notion of like what we have to be when we're like young people who are growing and learning amen sister yeah i think that i just like i love these questions christine because i feel like listening to eva talk and i was just like in admiration of eva and how you so eloquently said such a difficult experience for you i like see you when we make these things and like just like in admiration i don't really know how to describe the feeling i think this is amazing and i think for me it's really just like i live this life i've had these experiences and if these experiences line up with other folks experiences great but i have a unique lens here And I'm here to show up for that unique lens. I'm not going to take on that burden that someone else wants to put on me because it makes their life easier to assume that we all are the same or that they're doing something great for us by letting one of us in. Like, (laughs) we can't do that to ourselves. I can't feel like I have to carry that weight. That's just not right. I don't have the time or energy. It hinders you. Absolutely. And I think I would say it would start even as soon as you're entering like undergrad, especially like putting myself out on YouTube saying I am an Asian woman entering Harvard after the recent lawsuit. There's just always going to be so many tags and all these attached labels that you never even asked for. It's so refreshing to see that all of you are doing that so beautifully and gracefully. 
This is kind of a question that I know a lot of people were curious about. What have your experiences with both patients and colleagues been? This notion of being a woman of color in medicine. It kind of feels like it's just like a gray cloud like looming in the future, but we don't know what it even really entails. Yeah, I'd say being a woman of color in medicine, coming from a 5'2 Asian American woman, um, they ain't really expecting someone to be so outspoken. Like, oh, we didn't expect that. I was like, "Mm mm-hmm. I think a lot of institutions nowadays, especially with the rise of Black Lives Matter, like to co-opt the advocacy and uplift their own social status. But sometimes when students like myself and many others are outspoken about it, that's not met with kindness. You're just a med student. How can you know more about this than us? I've had to be face to face with a lot of administrators who have threatened me, who have harassed me. But once, for example, the Freedom School grows, Woke Woke Docs grows, then these same people who threaten or criticize me in the past then become some of the greatest public supporters on Twitter. It's this really convoluted way. I think that's been difficult in my experience as a woman of color being committed to social justice and medicine. I can speak to my experience with patients. I just love patient care in general. Like I just love getting to know my patients. I think it's so important to know their stories and just get to know them on a deeper level whenever I get other women of color patients that oh my gosh I feel like I am just so overjoyed my black women patients especially those are the patients that I've really been able to like cry with and who really have cried to me patients get so excited seeing someone who looks like them can understand some of their struggles one of those things where you leave clinic and you're still thinking about it not that I don't do this for all my patients I'm just saying I feel like the women of color especially and like my black women can really appreciate it on another level when I feel like people aren't listening listening to them or like not trusting them. I'll be like, that's not actually what happened. This is what happened. Cause girl told me the whole story. I know, (laughs) don't worry. Like I got it from A to Z and then you can really advocate for them too. So I just really want the woman of color listening to feel actually can and will make a difference with your patients because it definitely will happen. Language concordance is something that's also so really beautiful when speaking to patients is just like they don't have to explain what that word means because there is no word in English for it being able to be that person in that space feels really amazing like I'm that bridge like no it's not cramps no it's not this and I'm not gonna let you like merge them together because that's gonna give a different outlook on what this person is in for I think medical education is traumatizing it could be little t traumas or big t traumas when people are traumatized they take on traumatic responses if those people stay in academia they haven't been able to heal so what they do is they continue traumatizing others one of the first people to go under the hierarchy is medical students right so we receive a lot of the trauma that they've received that's why spaces like our podcast is so important because we're trying to heal ourselves in order to hold the space for our patients to be like you know what that's your trauma I'm sorry you had to go through it but that has absolutely nothing to do with me and I won't be accepting this treatment. But you can only do that when you're so secure in your own truth and you have these communities that make you feel like that again and again and again. Absolutely. I mean, that's all just so inspiring. And the whole idea of a healing mindset when you're entering into medicine, I think the first time I really interacted with that was like through your your podcast, the idea of being a healer instead of just like that more sterile image of being a doctor. Of course, I'm speaking, this is all in the future for me, but it's so amazing that you are all able to kind of bring that mindset to your work kind of to make it like a little bit more fun I wanted to know what your personal favorite healing activity is when you're stressed or overwhelmed to shift your energy back to taking care of yourself this is just me asking for pointers (laughs) I took up pottery and pottery on the wheel in particular like anything that I'm going through shows up on that wheel if I'm not being patient with myself that bowl is going flying. And if I'm not being nice to myself, I will make a hole in that bowl. And so like, I have to practice do these things on the wheel that really ground me and I'm touching dirt, like my hands are dirty and dirt. And so it's just an amazing space for me. I didn't do it before medical school, like medical school made me an artist because I didn't do any of this. Like I was in computers all day. I make sure that healing is part of my mornings, especially, but I just make it a daily ritual, whether I'm having a great day, a bad day, but I'm not only going to when I feel bad. I'm a morning person. I'm literally asleep by like 10. So we got like two hours, y'all. Basically what I do is I wake up, usually get seven to eight hours of sleep every day, drink a glass of water, and then I journal affirmations in the form of may I. So whatever comes to me. So may I exude patience today with myself, or may I show compassion to others. I meditate 
meditate for ideally 15 minutes, but sometimes it's five. And then I either do a few stretches and this is all before I look at my phone. So I'm like reserving the first hour of my day for me. I sort of already mentioned some of the things that I love to do, singing, running, dancing. Thing and just going for runs and then also praying. I'm Catholic. I've always found that to be really important to me. And I feel like whenever I'm getting super anxious, I'm like, oh, have I prayed today? Or have I like just spent time with myself thinking about the good of others? That's what I love about praying. You need to just spend time with yourself away from your phone and just being in tune with your body, your mind, and your spirit. I think everyone does that in different ways. You will probably have a completely different thing than us, Christine. These days, something that I found personally really healing has actually been editing videos. I I love how it's just my own creative space. From start to finish, it's entirely my own. Finding healing in your own activities that bring you joy. And I'm taking Oreo this year, so I need that. So, you know, I'm working through it. You don't want to know the things that I did to do well in Orgo at Harvard. The way that class nearly killed me. For all the Harvard folks, you know Kirkland <laughs> Library? The girl spent two nights sleeping in Kirkland Library trying to do well on that Orgo exam. Thought I was going to try to set the curve. We did not set the curve. <laughs> we got like seven points below the average. You can spend, like, even though we're in shelter in place and we're all spending time alone, just because like we're alone in our rooms doesn't mean that we're really spending time with ourselves, you know, or like we're not really, mm -hmm. we're spending time with ourselves, but we're not really in touch with ourselves always. So just want to put that plug up there you can be alone in your room all day but like are you really spending time nourishing your soul printer eva you know how i do oh i need to hear that mm. this is just something i was personally really curious about what do you think you would be doing in an alternate universe where medicine just wasn't your thing it wasn't really in the picture okay i'm so proud of myself because when i saw this on the document i was like nah you're gonna see all of this in this universe okay <laughs> Because I think it's honestly true. I mean, yes, we're doctors, but like, yo, we didn't even see ourselves as podcasters, but now we're like media personalities and like have this public persona. I also identify as like dancer. Now I'm a cook. Two years ago, I started becoming a runner. You know what I'm saying? All these different identities that I'm uncovering are going to be manifested and I'm going to be that person that's like having her own clinic, also my own fashion line alongside a newspaper because like that's who I am. It's totally possible for all of us to be who we are. Yeah, I, I was going to say something very similar to Bernie. There's something about Western thinking and having like the one thing that you do for the rest of your life. And that's like, you have to make that choice. I had that going into medical school. And it's actually really tough to go in with that mentality that it's like one thing for the rest of your life. For me, I don't know yet. I'm gonna figure it out as far as like what I want to do in the future with medicine. I do for sure. Like I, I remember thinking like, okay, yeah, for sure. Kindergarten teacher. Like I love being around kindergartners. I love planning things. I remember like playing with dolls when I was little. It spent like an hour setting up like this whole scene. Like this is what's gonna happen. These people are sitting here, set it up and then like, okay, I'm done. But it's just like, wait, you're not gonna make them talk to each other? It's like, no, 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 I'm done. Like I just wanted to do the planning. I wanted to set this up. And so that's something that's like slowly coming back to me. Like, oh yeah, I remember I used to love doing that. I also am really happy that Bernie said that she wants all of these, like not in an alternate universe, but in this universe, because all the things I was going to say, I actually actively want for myself in this lifetime. I really like storytelling. I'm not exactly sure what form I want that to be in. Right now, I think it's probably going to be through writing. I also really think it'd be cool to, I had like a little radio show in high school, which is like so small, but honestly, I think I've always seen myself as potentially being a radio show host. Or like when I was really young, I, I wanted to be like Oprah. I was like, I would be a great talk show host. Like, oh my gosh, this would be so much fun. And a little part of me still wants that. I think maybe like radio, because people don't have to necessarily like know my face all the time. I can still keep it humble. I can go to the grocery store with nobody following me. Um, things like that. And then like, like the other one would be something with more dancing and singing. I would love for it to be something slightly more formalized. I absolutely love what you all did with this question. Like this kind of mindset is what I need in my life. I absolutely love how this has just turned into like a manifestation session. I want to wrap it up with one final question. Like I said, so many people do watch my channel because they are hoping to attend medical school. A lot of them are women of color. So if you were to rewind a bit, undergraduate, Nicole, Brittany, EVA. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't be yourself, that you can't serve the communities that you want to serve. 
and just continue to love people with your whole heart. I feel like people try to like take the love out of it. But at the end of the day, when you're a doctor, you are a person who is working to heal people and you want the best for them. Don't worry about everybody else telling you that like your GPA isn't high enough or your MCAT score isn't high enough. They only want to take you because you're black or you're Latina or you're whatever. Like, don't let them tell you those things. Or if they do tell you, just like literally let it go through one year and out the other because you are meant to do this. If you want to do this, you can do this and keep being the baddie that you are. That's what I would tell my younger self. I love that. Thank you for saying that. I think that's so appropriate and so beautifully said. And to add to that for me, it would just be like, breathe, boo. You know, you need to breathe. You need to calm down. Like, same. The same. world like, the world is not on your shoulders. Think and be committed to a purpose rather than a career path. And so like for me, I think my purpose is really in furthering healing and being a bridge. And that allows me the openness to realize that there are so many different ways my life can turn to be committed to that purpose. Having that being the prime motivating factor rather than these societal titles or designations because there are multiple ways to really serve your life's purpose. I love these questions. Thank you for asking it, Christine. Like I love the chances to talk to my younger self in these ways. Usually I have a day of the month where I'm like writing a love letter to myself and I haven't done it in a really long time. So this was like brought that back. I wrote myself like a love letter to who I was. Dear Nicole, the journey to medical school is difficult full of doubt. Sometimes it's self-imposed, but usually it's an internalization of the society that you live in. May you be gentle and patient with yourself. You're doing the best you can. The moment you realize you are more than your grades, more than what people think about you, more than all the less than messages you have been taught, you are on your way towards liberation, freeing yourself from the prison that was created by our society. Follow your passions, learn what feels good and makes you excited. Follow that. There is no checklist. You will get to where you need to be by following the things that bring you to life. May you realize that this develops over time, this passion, and don't feel pressured to follow anyone else's timeline. You're doing great. And most of all, may you make the cultivation of self-love the top priority in your life at this young age. Our world is built upon feeling bad about ourselves. We spend money on things to make us feel better and accept less than we deserve because we are fed the lie of scarcity. But love, you are already whole and beautiful, just like every other living thing. Like Rumi alludes to, you don't have to search for this love because it's already there and it already exists. Your job is to look for all the barriers to love and examine their usefulness to your current life so that you can love yourself and fully accept who you are and not accept any less from anyone else. May you step into your power as the only you, the only person who has lived through the combined sets of experiences through your lens. The world needs you. You can do it. I love you forever, Nicole at 30. So beautiful. Yes, girl. And that's the episode. (laughs) I got like full body chills like three times while you were reading that. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was beautiful and absolutely amazing way to end this video, this chat. Thank you all once again for joining me on this amazing discussion. It was absolutely incredible. I'll be leaving the links to all of the the podcasts, your Instagram. We're not on Twitter. So our Instagram, they can find us on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud. We're doing an series. So just looking at anti-racism in different institutions like medicine, schools with policing, wellness industry. And just thank you so much for having us here, Christine. It's been really a pleasure to be here and learn and talk and reflect. Thank you again for taking the time to chat with me. I guess this is it for the video. Yay!